Thank you so much. Um, so, you know, I kind of took a wandering trail to kind of get into cybersecurity, but I think that's how a lot of us ended up in cybersecurity. Like, you know, years ago when I went to school, there wasn't like a cybersecurity degree program. So I have a pretty varied um, focus in a lot of things in IT, a lot of it focusing around protecting the data. And now I've just kind of got this wider scope where I'm spinning up a program. Um, today at my company, we spend a lot of time focusing on protecting email because we think that's one of the easiest ways for the bad guy to get in. So today I'm gonna to spend some time speaking to you specifically about business email compromise. And as you can see from this logo right here on the screen, it's kind of a combination of three core things. The social engineering, so the bad guy kind of manipulating you to get you to do what he wants. And then the phishing, so that's all those emails that you get at work that that might seem legitimate but they're really not and then the fraud and that's the bad guy trying to take money from your company so business email compromise is also referred to as BEC if you ever see that um, acronym out there and basically business email compromise is a sophisticated email scam that um, is focused on businesses that have a high volume of regular wire transfers so, you know, a lot of companies do business that way because they're either taking money in via wire transfers or they're paying their bills out via wire, transfer, via wire transfers. So a lot of companies are going to be susceptible to this. A lot of times the bad guy is going to be focused on the executive's email accounts. And really these days they're looking after getting any publicly listed email address. So like a lot of times you go to a conference or you belong to some sort of professional organization, a lot of the times they're posting your email address on their website, and then it becomes really easy for the bad guys to get your email address. And let's not forget their favorite, LinkedIn. So they, they go comb, comb, or mining through there to get your information as well. Just something to be aware of. I'm not saying like don't put your information on LinkedIn. That's just one of the sources they'll use. And that's just kind of the price of doing business today. Your email is going to be out there. Because it's even going to be out there on like your company's website. Like who's doing what? Get a hold of this person. So um, the attackers are going to use this phishing email that they send you to get a foothold to get into your business to start doing their bad stuff. BEC has cost businesses over... 12 billion dollars since they have started doing this. So I mean, this is for a long time, but 12 billion dollars, that's, that's big money for them. And just since December 2016 through May 2018, so a year and a half, there's been a 136% increase globally in the number of businesses that have been um, reporting that they've been <coughs> susceptible to this. And then you've probably heard a lot in the news about ransomware because like Atlanta, millions and millions of dollars to get that back up and recover, or, and recover after they got hit with ransomware. The net profit that the bad guys make from business email compromise is 100 times that over what they can get from ransomware. So, yeah. When did business email compromise start? Like how long has this been happening? It's really been going on, you know, on as long as businesses have been using email. So, I mean, it probably became a lot more rampant in the, you know, mid-90s. It was probably in full swing by then because at that point, just about everybody, if you were at work, you had an email address. So here's the high points of what I'm going to touch on tonight. I'm going to talk to you about phishing at a high level. We're going to go over the five main types of BEC. We'll talk us about some of the BEC trends that are out there today. I'll talk to you about how you can defend against the scam and then I'll get like a little techie, but I just want to get out there the fact that you can use DMARC to stop impersonation. So even if you're not like on the email team, this might be a question that you can raise to your company and say, is, is this something we're doing to stop impersonation? And I'll get into all the details about why you want to do that as well. So phishing. How many of you think you've been phished at work? Probably, probably everybody, probably many times a day, right? You, you lose count, even with all that sophisticated stuff they're paying for to protect your email, you're still getting fished probably at least once a day, if not more. So the whole concept is phishing is, um, it's just a cyber attack that uses emails, um, sneakily disguised, and they're gonna use them as a weapon against you. They want to trick the recipient into believing that they need or want whatever they've got in that email. The attacker is often going to impersonate a trusted person or business. So like you'll just 
look at that email, you glance, you'll see that name you always see, and you'll just click and do whatever it says. Um, there's also something called a phishing kit that's out there today. It makes it so easy for the bad guy to fish you. It's just a couple of steps and they're up and running. So what they do with these kits, the first step is they pick out the legitimate website that they want to target and they quickly clone it. So they just make a copy of it. And then they're also going to create a copy of that login page. And then there's a script that runs on the back end. And once you are typing and logging in, it's capturing all of your login credentials to the legitimate site, even though you're at this fake site. And then once they get all of that, um, they can bundle the credentials that you got, the information that they got while you're on their fake site, and they just bundle it with uh, the website resources and tools that come with this phishing kit. And all they have to do is install it on a server. They don't even have to have their own server. You know, there's all this web hosting out there. They can put it on there. And if they're an attacker, they've probably compromised somebody's web hosting out there anyways, and they're putting it on there illegitimately. And then once they've cloned it, gotten your login credentials, gotten email information, they just um, simply use the tool in there to send out a whole bunch of emails to a whole bunch of victims all at once. It's really easy. <laughs> yeah, you can do a Google search and find them. The ones that kind of pop to the top are probably not going to be as sophisticated um, or work as well as some of the other ones that you have to do a little more digging for. The more sophisticated tools are going to be, um, you know, if you've heard like the dark web and that yeah, sort of stuff. Sure. And most of the time you can just get them for free. And, and so now you can sense it, so you can easily download it, and it's free. It makes it really easy to do. So are the websites usually that are targeted for this sort of thing, ones where people are logging into some sort of account for like some sort of bill pay, where there's like credit card information maybe being passed. I mean, is it like, like you know, like if I'm going to pay my power bill or my 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 cable bill or my cell phone bill, uh, cell phone bill, are those typically more targeted in that sort of campaign? Not for this type of campaign. For this, they're really looking to steal your credentials at work. So they're going to use like tools that you might use at work for collaboration. So like Microsoft Office 365 or OneDrive or Dropbox. You know, and it could even get, you know, a lot of businesses are starting to use Slack and stuff like that. So they might try to target you through that. So they could basically gain No, they just want to get information so they can basically start fu funneling money out of your company into them, whether it's them telling you um, or telling your company to send them money or telling your customers to send them money instead of you. So there's a lot of other scams going around on here, but the business email compromise is mainly focused on them trying to steal a lot of money from your company. And there's some other stuff they do as well, but the main focus is they want to try to get as much money out of your company as possible. Um, the other things that they will do, and this is kind of getting onto what you were doing, try, they will try to get sensitive information or they will try to get you to download malware if they want to do worse to your company. That's kind of as it's um, progressed more in recent years is, you know, the bad guy wants to get in, they want to use your computer to get a foothold to do other bad things across the company. So maybe they want to take down your websites or they want to take down your services that you provide or maybe they just want to steal all of your employee information. Um, I'm going to skip the video, um, but I don't know if we're going to share the slides afterward, but if like you wanted to use this at work, this would be kind of a good video to, to jump to, to explain it to some people. So there's five main types of BEC, um, and this is kind of what's been categorized by the um, FBI. And so the number one scheme that's out there, and this has been out there for a long time, is bogus invoice scheme. The next one is CEO fraud. There's account compromise attorney impersonation, and data theft. Those are the fame five main types, and there's actually a sixth one I'll jump into at the end, but th that's kind of newer. But like typically, this is what the FBI is going to be reporting on. And so I'll go into the details of all of these. So the bogus invoice scheme, this is, this is an oldie, but it's a goodie. As, as, as soon as the bad guys started doing this, this is what they were doing. Um, they usually are going to involve some sort of business that you already have an existing relationship because they're just counting on you to be like, oh yeah, I'm used to working with Acme, I'll just do whatever they say. 
versus if it was a brand new company, you'd probably pay a lot more scrutiny to it on that first transaction. Normally what the, the, guy, the attacker does is he's going to ask you to wire funds to an alternate account, which is actually a fraudulent account. They'll normally do this um, via email, but it's a spoofed email. And it's really, in theory, it's not supposed to be a sustainable process because how many times could you be attacked and spoofed like this before you quit fraudulently wiring out money? But the problem is, you know, people and turnover and they're getting more and more sophisticated as time goes on because those emails that they're sending you are getting better and better and looking more and more legitimate all of the time. And so I mentioned spoofed email. Um, if you're not familiar with that, that is where they take a domain and send that email from it and it looks really close to your website that you use. So, for example, if you wanted to use um, Google, instead of using O's, you could use zeros because if you're just glancing at it, the zeros look very close to O's. So they're just looking for something real close to kind of get you. So here I have an example of an email that you might receive that's actually a bogus invoice. So you can see there's the from and the to um, from Jane and John at Acme. They're talking about, you know, please transfer this immediately. There's an attachment with the wiring instructions. There's a message from John, please see Jim's email below. And then there's that email from Jim below saying, you know, Jane, you need to do this right away. So if you just take a minute, and, and if you can read it, kind of think about what you think is the uh, part here that's fake. Something else I want to draw your attention to is look at the time. It's, uh, ignore the fact that it's 2015, but it's a Friday at 4.56 p.m. A lot of the times the attackers are going to send these emails out towards the end of the day, especially on a le long weekend because everybody's got weekend-itis and they just want to get out of there, so they're just going to do it and move on with their weekend. Yep, yep, you got it. And if you're just glancing at it, right. you know, because you just read probably the first part. Good catch. Anybody else notice anything kind of fishy in here? Well, they're being urgent about the ask down below. Like, do it tonight. Yep, yep. Like, you're changing where you're sending a payment. That's kind of a big deal, too. Like, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And that's what the attackers are always going to do. They're going to try to get that search of sense of urgency. Do it right now. Do it right away. It's extremely important. This can't win at all. I'll just kind of. So we we picked these this stuff up, but if you look at the bottom, this is not an actual forwarded message. They've just typed it all out in plain text and they've kind of put in, you know, the from and to and made it look like a forward. And sometimes when you forward, you have all the indents and things like that, but you could easily copy this in plain text. But again, it's giving more like authenticity to this email because it's got a chain. It's been forwarded. You know, Jim said do it. <laughs> so that's another way they're going to try to get you. So next I'll move on to CEO fraud. Um, this is where the attacker pretends to be a high-level executive. So it can be the um, CEO or a lot of the times it's going to be like your CEF CFO, those people involved in moving lots of money around. Again, the same thing. They're going to convey that sense of urgency. You need to do it right now. And they're often going to you know, reiterate that it's time sensitive. You got to do it today, right away. Or they might also um, convey to you that it's a very confidential matter in an effort so you won't talk to anybody else about it as well. Um, and again, these are normally sent towards the end of the day. They, all of them are, you know, they kind of have the same MO. End of day, sense of urgency, um, you know, and don't tell anybody else about it. The next one is account compromise. And this kind of gets into more of where they're cloning that website and trying to get you to log in. And the reason they want you to log into that website that they've cloned is so that they can get your credentials to log into your account at work. And then in business email compromise with those um, 
credentials that they've scammed from you, they're going to use it to get into your email account. And what they'll do is they'll, um, they'll use that hacked email account to make requests for invoice payments. So they're going to start emailing your customers. They'll email multiple vendors on your employee contact list. And a lot of the times the business isn't even going to catch on until the customers follow up on the invoice status. And I'll kind of dig into more how they do this um, when I talk about the new exploitation method. The next one is the attorney impersonation. This one probably isn't as um, common, but it does happen and it's something to be aware of. A lot of the time the attacker is going to contact someone in your business. Um, it could be a regular employee, it could be an executive, and they're going to identify themselves as a lawyer. And they're going to do the same thing. It's a very time sensitive manner. Um, it's confidential. Don't tell anybody about this. Um, they're going to pressure the employee or whoever they've contacted to quickly and secretly transfer those funds. Um, and again, doing it towards the end of the day. And the um, final category of data theft, or excuse me, of BEC is data theft. And this is where the attacker compromises, compromises the email of the account of a specific role um, at your office. So on different times of the year, like HR is, specific, um, is pretty popular. So during like um, benefits enrollment season or when everybody's sending out the W-2s, that's when they really start to target HR. But depending on your business, there might be you know, some other role that they might um, target so they can get more money out of them or more information out of them. And for the data theft, they're relying on that um, compromised email account. So they've already stolen your credentials. And what they'll do in these cases is they'll be in your system internally and they'll start requesting um, PII, which is personal identifiable information from other employees at the company. So they'll like act like your HR manager and say, you know, Susie, I need your social security number or verify your social security number or stuff like that. <coughs> and they're really banking on the social engineering aspect of this. Because again, you know, people kind of get a little crazy when it comes to like benefits and W-2 and their paycheck and stuff like that. So they're like, HR, all right, I'm just gonna give you that answer right away. Um, and you know, we, we as companies spend a lot of money on email protection systems. Those systems are not gonna flag this. One is coming from inside your company from an authenticated user, and it's not gonna have that high volume, so it's not gonna get flagged as spam because it's, you know, the bad guy sending them out onesie twosie. So those were the, the five main categories of BEC. Um, do we want to, does anybody have any questions specific to any of those before I move on to kind of the newer BEC that's out there? All right. So the new BEC uh, method they refer to as the DocuSign fish. I'm sure you've probably seen this today. Um, but the, the attackers are kind of expanding what they're doing um, just because of the way everybody works today and how businesses you know, do their business. Um, they'll still do all those you know, wire fraud um, and try to get all those funds wired um, fraudulently to them or get the money moved around to them. Um, but they're also focusing on information more and more these days. Um, so this is referred to as the DocuSign fish because of the, the way it first kind of gained a foothold in the industry. Basically what the bad guy wants to do is, is they're just gonna flood, flood the market, flood the email addresses and get anyone they can to, sit, to click on a bad link. And they're going to use a whole bunch of scams to lure you in. You know, it'll say stuff like uh, view encrypted document, view that shared file, come get your prize winnings, you know, just any of these things to make it enticing to you to click on it. Um, they like to use like click on this secure file or this encrypted file because people have come to learn, well, if it says encrypted, it must be safe. So it's going to be OK to click on it. But we need to make sure that people understand, even if it's encrypted file, it could still contain bad things and do bad things to your computer. And, you know, it first became popular with the actual DocuSign site, because I think DocuSign's really got a lot more popularity in the recent years from all the real estate transactions. I kind of think that's where, where it first came. And now more and more businesses are used to, are using it. So when people see DocuSign, they're like, oh, yeah, I should get on here and sign this document. But today it's really not 
limited to DocuSign. They'll do impersonations of OneDrive, Office 365, Box, Dropbox, Google Drive, like anything you can think of where people share a lot of files, do collaboration. They're going to um, try to impersonate those signs and send you that bad link to click on. Um, and it's doing what I talked about earlier. It's going to read once you click on that link, it's going to redirect you to a seemingly legit site and it's going to steal your credentials once you log in. And then once your account is compromised, they're going to log into your inbox and they're going to sit there and they're going to watch it. And if they're looking for money, they're going to sit there and watch for the money to flow back and forth or see what your emails are and see what that's looking like. And before they get ready to start conducting business on your behalf, they're going to implement some mailbox rules to clean up their tracks. So like basically you guys are both going to be in your email inbox all day long together at the same time. But with these rules, once they send a message out, it's going to auto delete it, empty it from the trash, and you'll never know it was there, even if you went back to look for it. And let's see. The um, attacker is emailing the, your vendors, your customers from your email account, and they're emailing other people from or in, within your company. And so if you've maybe seen like those external tags, like it'll say external or ext when you get like email from someone outside of your company, because it's the bad guy using your coworker's email, you're not going <coughs> to get that tag to give it a second look. Because um, I know a lot of companies spend a lot of time training employee. Okay, if it has this external tag, you really, really need to look at it closely. Give it a second look before you start clicking on stuff. Well, when it's internal, it's like, I know Susie. I'm going to click on it. It's internal. I don't have the external tag. I'm, I'm good to go. It's not an impersonation. So it, it just is something else to make it a little trickier to catch that bad guy. And then once they're in the business and they've compromised your email account, they're going to actually use the same method to send more emails out to your coworkers so they can compromise more of your co coworkers' email accounts. And it basically just propagates over and over and more and more. So here's an example of a fake login page for OneDrive. And so, you know, it looks like the OneDrive symbol. It says OneDrive. It's spelled correctly. It's got the little clouds on here. And if you don't use OneDrive a lot, you might not realize that you normally don't get to sign in with all these different options. But again, that's just the attacker trying to get more login credentials from you and get as many as they can. So they're like, oh, well, I'll just list, you know, Office 365, Outlook, Yahoo, all this different stuff that people might have so I can get more and more login credentials from them. And so you're like, well, why do they care about like my personal Yahoo email account? The reason they care about that is because you're probably using that password in more than one place. So, you know, that's the same reason you see like LinkedIn and Yahoo, just all these whatever websites that get hacked in the news because they're trying to get all your passwords so they can use those as, you know, practice or really the answer to get into your office. So that's why that matters. So I guess I think we're doing okay on time. Um, there's probably some miscellaneous stuff that you guys have seen out there. And Marcy and I were talking before class about the uh, the gift card can't scam. Um, Marcy has been. I'll, do you want to go over the one you've seen with the campaign for the fundraising? Because I haven't seen that one yet. I thought that was kind of so interesting. I work at, at the University uh, in Lincoln, and we just had uh, our cybersecurity team just sent out an email yesterday saying this is the season they're doing gift card scams right now. And so people are going to start seeing emails saying, hey, we're doing a fundraiser. Click the link to buy your gift card. And people are like, oh, well, I do a good thing. I'll do it. Uh, the other one is um, faculty, deans, uh, people in leadership who are saying, hey, we're doing a, um, a fundraiser. I need you to buy this gift card so we can use it for X, Y, and Z. And of course, if it's your dean, if it's your AVP, you click on it and you go ahead and start process of buying gift cards or accruing gift cards in some way. Um, it looks like it's internal, it's a scam, and uh, we're losing credentials and that kind of thing to it. So, but that was our big one that our cybersecurity team just sent out yesterday. So uh, with that kind of one, is it just like you clicking the link or do they go as far as like I'm putting my credit card information and like they want everything about you? 
Um, it depends. I haven't clicked on it, so what they're telling us is it's a gift card. So anytime you hear a gift card, beware. The irony is that everybody asked us to give to United Way from the United Way campaign the exact same day. And I think that uh, people giving to that was down because this same thing went out. And when you yeah. click on the United Way thing, it looks a little scammy. Right? Like, and everybody's like, oh, I don't know if I want to actually participate in that route when I get this email about not doing this fundraiser for gift cards. So. Um, it depends if you're internal or external. We use single sign-on for everything um, in our organization, so you can't sign on to Slack without using the single sign-on. Yeah. So um, we're somewhat secure that way, but once you get in, yeah. obviously if you're in it and you, you click on that, then you're just in it. You, you almost have to wonder, where, you know, was somebody's email account already compromised if they knew that that United Way campaign was going out that same day? You know, I, I, I don't know, but it's an interesting thought. You always kind of kind of wonder. The one that we've seen from a gift card perspective is more of like, you know, um, somebody's impersonating your CEO, they email somebody at work and they're like, um, I'm in a all day meeting, I can't talk, but this is super urgent. I need you to buy me like 20 Amazon gift cards or like 20 <laughs> iTunes gift cards and scratch off the codes and send me pictures. I need them right away, but I can't talk. And so um, I'm not sure how people fall for that, but I guess it's just kind of like that whole, um, urgency, it's the CEO asking for it, and it, it must be, you know, um, legitimate if it's coming from the CEO. Well, I've never seen a gift card, like, fundraiser, really, until just actually recently. It's funny you say this, because I just saw one, a friend of mine on Facebook, and said a strange, I mean, she was actually sending it to her before, and if anyone wants to buy gift, gift cards, cards in bulk, like, it had a whole page. You can buy them from Amazon to Shields to, I mean, you name the vendor. And she had like a little sheet that she had taken a picture of and posted it, you know. So it was legit fundraiser for I think their kids' school or whatever. But I was like, oh, that's kind of it. And I actually was like, oh, that's interesting. But I could see how, you know, maybe in a I had never seen it in a work ad mm -hmm. before. But we we yeah. saw an interesting one at the beginning of the football season. Obviously, uh, Coach Frost is a big deal in Lincoln, and people were trying to sell their football tickets. And they would take pictures of the tickets, including the barcode that you could scan. And so then people would take that and steal those tickets before the person could sell them on Facebook or StubHub or something like that. We just bought a pair of those two they, weeks ago. Yeah, and then they <laughs> would, the Minnesota game. They would start using them. And yeah. so that was one of the things. If you take a picture of the entire ticket and say, hey, I have two tickets for this thing, they just automatically take them use them and then the person who's really buying the tickets saying yeah i really want to go to the game and then they go and it doesn't work mm -hmm. because somebody else somebody already else has in. already taken them yeah, yep. yeah. Wow. i mean it just goes to prove that tickets or whatever which and that yeah. might not so much be the feeling of your credentials <laughs> though if the barcode is attached to your user account and you have season tickets they could maybe perhaps get some of that information oh, yeah. but yeah. they now know a name attached to the season ticket holders seats it's pretty easy to identify all that you're still you're scamming people who are paying for something that don't get, which is your eBay scam. Yeah, I mean the attackers are just really, you know, they're they're they got nothing but time in their hands to you know commit these crimes, and so they're adapting to the way that we you know do business, the way we communicate, the way we share information, you know, and they're sending in your email and they're reading it all anyway, so they're right on top of it and they they quickly adapt. You know, they want to make a lot of money and they want to do as little work as possible, and sometimes we make it really easy for them. So is this like one guy in a dark room? <laughs> you get that half the company, you get half the half, like, really, there's two people that work together, or is it like one guy? Well, sometimes, so it's both. I mean, there is some, you know, um, especially with, like, ransomware, they are running it, like, as a business, but, and so it's more of, like, the organized crime. So they've, you know, instead of robbing banks, now they just hack your email and, you know, do fraudulent wire transfers now. Just a different way to steal money. about it, they're a gold mine. Typically they lock everything up in a filing cabinet. They don't keep up to date. They might be still running Windows XP. They have a security <laughs> system, but what's on the door? And any one person who's practicing family law has all birth, all death, all divorce, all bank, all tax information on an entire family of users. That is a gold mine. And so there's a lot of ransomware issues. Even now there's a number of firms that 
they're targeted in their hit because of all of the personal information that they have on file about all of their clients yep. and all the business that they do. And sometimes they just steal this information and then they sit on it for a while waiting to use it for the perfect time for an attack. I mean, because if you're doing like benefits enrollment right now, you know, your social security number and things like that might get compromised and you don't think anything of it, but then they're waiting until tax season rolls around. So like, you know, February, they're trying to file your taxes for you before before you get it done, you know, and, and it could kind of come out of the blue because you're like, well, I don't remember anything happening in the last couple of weeks. Why would somebody have my social security number? And, you know, if, if we're honest about it, I mean, there's so many compromises and data breaches out there, you know, to think our personal information is, is personal and private, it's, it's a bit of a reach. Um, you know, and, and so I think, you know, I'll, I'll jump into this, some, but some of the things we can do to prevent the phishing and the business email compromise is at least protecting your business if you're self-employed, I mean, that's really important for you to keep your business up and running. But it's some tips and tricks and stuff like that that you can take home to protect yourself there as well. So I'll kind of start to wrap up. I wanted to real quickly hit some of the trends that are going on with BEC right now. Like I mentioned, you know, the bad guys want anybody to click on, on the link. So, you know, they're advertising it as a secure link to, like, basically any file sharing website that's out there. Um, they're trying to steal your personal information. They're trying to steal your tax information. They want to file your taxes for you and take your refund. Or they're even going to sit and wait longer than that because you never know what can come down the way that they want to um, get from you or use to manipulate you. Um, they're oftentimes targeting HR for sensitive employee information. Um, they're starting to target a lot more um, real estate transactions because you know all those um, laws that have been put in place to like protect your real estate transaction means that now you're wiring money because you know you can't take a personal check you can't do a cashier's check or stuff like that anymore so a lot of the times it's last minute oh why are your funds here instead so they a lot of the times they're going after you the customer and telling you to change um, where you're wiring your money for for closing so that's something to be aware of um, you know originally they're focusing on executives because they're kind of the power people. They had the money, could move the money around, but it's a wide net now. Um, so here's some information on um, top imposters in BEC. So I think it's kind of what you would expect. The, the most fake position in a company is still the CEO, a lot of the executives, things of that nature, but they're still hitting 20% of the rest of the population. Um, and you know, impersonating them. And then the targeted positions, again, it kind of aligns up, you know, they're going to target the CEO, the executives, and this one's even greater, you know, 40% of the company nearly that they're looking to target to get information from. In case you're curious, what are the top email subjects that the uh, FBI has knowledge of? They're really simple. So like request for day, month, year, transfer, request, urgent, transfer request. Not, nothing fancy. Those are the subject lines. Yep, those are the subject lines that the attackers tend to send out. So now I'm going to move on to what you can do to defend against the scam. Um, this is kind of ge geared toward your business, but keep in mind there's a lot of this stuff that you could you do um, at home. So the first thing I mentioned is security awareness training program. Um, and that's something that your business would do, but the recommendation for this is this is something that your business should do regularly. This just shouldn't be like the annual training that comes around and everybody groans and rolls their eyes and is like, I have to click through the same presentation that I've clicked through every other year for the past seven years. So, you know, companies should, you know, do it regularly, kind of make it part of your culture and they should mix, mix it up. There's a lot of companies doing some good work out there. You know, they're doing it more in a, interactive, spot that fake email, and some of them kind of have some more games. But I think the main thing is just to sort of mix it up and not make it too long, because um, we want the people to get something out of it and be able to apply it to what they're doing at work. So in some of those cases, you might have to really customize it to your business, because what we do might be different than what you do, and so it might not seem as pertainable to some others and different businesses. Um, if you are in a company that does vendor payments, you want to do a secure secondary sign-off method. So that way they can't just email in and say, oh, change all this wiring information to something else. 
And you also want to confirm transfers via telephone with known phone numbers. So in this case, if they get you that email, don't look to the signature or call whatever phone number they said. Pull out like your SOP and call that list of known phone numbers instead. You also want to stay up to date with customer habits and scrutinize instructions. So, you know, you probably have a, a regular rhythm with this customer or you're used to processing their invoices a certain way. So just kind of, you know, notice over time if that's changing or not changing and then if it suddenly does, that should bring a red flag out for you as well. You should also add um, external tag to the subject of your emails. So that way, when an external email comes in, your employees can take an extra couple of minutes, scrutinize that from an email address and see if it's really real. And then, you know, we also have a, this is kind of funny, we've done um, some phishing and you just kind of impersonate somebody at your company and you're not even using like their full name, you use a really obvious fake email address and, and people click on it, even with the external tag. So the external tag helps, but I think more and more we can give people at our offices those clues to look at, the better off we're gonna be. And then another thing, when you're looking at these fishy emails or those emails that seem too good to be true, consider were you even expecting this email in the first place? We've done some of the um, phishing with the invoice scans, um, scams. We have people who have nothing to do with invoices at all clicking on them. It's like, why, why are you, you know, dealing with the invoices? So kind of consider where you're expecting it. Does this pertain to me before you start e um, opening those fishy emails? Heavily scrutinize that sender's email address. Um, look at it a few times because like the one we had, they just flipped two letters around. It's really easy, you know, to miss that. L's and ones look the same, zeros and O's look the same. So have a couple of looks. Um, and even when people are telling you that it's super urgent that you do whatever they say in that email right away, follow procedure. Another thing you can do, people don't do this enough, but you can call and ask the sender about the email. And I think this is kind of what the attackers are relying on and the CEO fraud and executive fraud is you're not gonna call the CEO. Okay, so maybe you're in a really big company and you don't wanna call the CEO. That doesn't mean you can't call someone and escalate it up the chain. So, you know, talk to your supervisor, talk to your manager and have them run up, up the chain and make sure this is legitimate. Another thing that companies can do is implement digital signatures on their email. And the last thing I'm gonna to touch on is DMARC. But before I dive into DMARC, does anybody have any questions about defending the yourself from the scam at work? Is it actually just opening the email or is it actually clicking on a link or a document that does the damage? So most of the time, it's going to be the actual clicking on the link or opening the attachment that is going to do the harm. Because most of the time, you open the email to see what it is. Right, exactly. Is. Exactly. And, and um, you know, some people work a lot off of their phones and spend depending on what your phone is, like you can't even see the email address, you just see the displayed name. So you would need to open that email to see you know, who they're from is. But yeah, everything that's going around today, you, you've got to take action and click on a link or open a file. Yeah, yeah. yeah. For a long time. And so it's like, did you just send me an email? Like, this is weird. Like, you know, and like, so you're kind of like, why would you send me an email? Like, we don't email. Like, you know, and that's, the, that's a perfect example because yeah. you're like, we don't, we don't email anymore. Maybe you yeah. just text or whatever. Right. And so it's probably a case where their email account got hacked, right. you know, because their credentials got compromised. And now the bad guy's just going through their entire address book sending everybody that link, hoping right. they'll click on it so he can compromise them too. Yep. Same thing to yep. 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 And, you know, sometimes it takes a while before, like uh, even at a business, for them to realize that the email account's been compromised. So, you know, it does behoove you and behoove, behoove that partner that you're working with to 
call and ask them because that's going to be the first clue that anything bad happened to them because the bad guys in your email are cleaning up their tracks. Any other questions about defending? <laughs> um, what, a couple of things, let me just throw them at you. Do you see, if, when you're buying new domains, for example, for a specific page oh, or mm -hmm. whatever, do you think it's worth it to go through the process and say, yep, I've got an L in it, I need to buy the, the domain with the one in it? Yeah, I mean, are, are these actual domains that they're spoofing from? And then my second question is, how do you feel about password managers? And do you, do you think that they are a good Sure. So I'll talk about like um, the spoof domains. So I do think it is a wise investment of time and money for companies to defensively register any website that is similar to yours. So I don't know that every company has to go to every every extreme of like subbing out every letter. But you know, so for example, like Lincoln Electric System, we always go by LES. So we have les.com purchase that's the, the website that our customers go to. But we've also defensively registered Lincoln Electric System so people can't spoof our website and so they can't spoof us via email as well. So, and, and I think it's kind of more important for um, them to try to use your email um, in a malicious way. And when the attackers are spoofing their email, they might be using um, a legitimate or you know a working domain because they want to like reply back and forth to you. It depends what they're trying to tell you to do. Um, but if they're not, and they're just wanting you to click on the link, then they probably just typed in whatever they wanted. And so if you tried to reply, it would just bounce back. Does that kind of answer your question? And then for passwords managers. Um, there's you know, a couple of different passwords manager styles out there that you can get. Some of them are where that information is just stored like locally on your computer or maybe you have a server set up within your office. Um, but the, f by far and more, the more prevalent password keepers are the ones online in the cloud. And I do think the password managers are a great idea because they are going to help your workforce manage their passwords. Um, because if they only have to remember like their network logon password and then their um, password manager password, that's really only two pieces of information that they have to keep track of. And then with the password managers on the, in the cloud, as long as you have multi-factor authentication, they should be very secure. And then that they also have a lot of the times um, a tool built into there where you can auto-generate passwords. And then so people can have really long, complex passwords. They don't have to type them in and it autofills. So overall, like if somebody's trying to, you know, whatever website you do business on, it's gonna be a lot harder for that attacker to guess that password because it's gonna be long and it's gonna be random. But then, you know, when you do have just two passwords that your employees remember, you know, those do have to be long and complicated just because, you know, if it's six digits, that's, that's easily guessed. Reset yeah. Like, oh my goodness. <laughs> it's like a major deal if you don't. Yeah. You forget that password. Yeah. 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 And and I think you know if they only have to rem remember two, that kind of makes them groan a little less, you know, instead of remembering you know twenty shorter passwords. So. So the last thing I wanted to wrap up with is um, DMARC. You can use DMARC to help stop impersonations um, via email. And so, you know, um, somebody else can be out there impersonating, like my company, LES.com, and telling people via email, you need to pay your bill, click on this link, send me money, blah, blah, blah. People impersonate the IRS via email. And um, without DMARC turned on, they can send emails out and it will say LES.com. And so if you turn on DMARC, and implement these different things, it will stop that from happening. Um, so there's three different parts to DMARC. There is SPF, which is the Sender Policy Framework. And so what this means is you gotta figure out 
where all of your legitimate emails are coming from. So if you have somebody sending bills out to your customers on behalf of you via email, but they use your from address, then you would wanna get the information from there, like where are your servers, what are their IP addresses, domain names, and then we will mark those as known good servers. So that way, if emails are coming from, from us at my company internally and from you at your third party company, we can both let those go through because we know where the good servers are. And then once we know the good servers, we can block emails coming from any of those other unknown bad servers. And then the second part of it is DCOM, which stands for Domain Keys Identified Mail. And think of this as um, asymmetric encryption. You're gonna use um, two different keys to ensure sender authenticity. So you'll have a public and private key. You'll normally do different keys for every different vendor um, to help stop impersonation and authenticate that it's coming from who it said it was coming from. And the last part is DMARC, um, Domain-Based Message Authentication Reporting and Conformance. So you know why we call it DMARC instead of that. Um, but basically, this allows you, the um, sender, the host of your email address, to indicate um, if your messages are protected or not. And it gives the receiver instructions of what to do if the SPF or the DCOM fails. So you kind of work it in order from top to bottom. So you start to figure out who your legitimate email senders are. You start to exchange keys with them. And then after you've got everybody identified, got all the, re the right information, then you'll enable DMARC to block those, email those fraudulent emails. And let's see here. Um, once you identify that, you can decide um, when you turn it on if you, you can do it in three phases. When you're getting started, you can just um, monitor it so you can see who's all impersonating you. I guarantee you'll see some interesting stuff, probably from Russia, China, Germany. I was kind of surprised to see stuff from Germany, but it's, it's from all over the globe people impersonate you. Even if you're a business who does you know, business in one city in Nebraska. So it's kind of interesting, it's all over the place. And then once you, and you'll use that monitoring mode to figure out who you need to get into contact with. Um, very helpful, especially if you're a big business. And then you'll exchange all the information. And then once you're kind of turning this on initially, you'll probably set it to quarantine. So then that way, um, if you miss somebody, it'll just go into the receiver's spam box and they can get to that message. Um, so nothing lost. But then after you've had it up and running for a while, you feel really confident, then you can set it to block and then that message won't even be delivered. So it's gonna cut down on your email traffic. It's gonna cut down on um, spam that people have to look at and consider if it's a legitimate or not. And then the most thing, important thing it's gonna do is protect your brand reputation because there's not somebody out there sending wonky emails on your behalf. And you have to remember your customers get it. They're, they probably don't know that somebody's impersonating you. So they're gonna go straight to the news and say, you know, company X did bad by me. So here's a, a chart here that um, kind of goes through the flow and I kind of walk through it, but basically at the end of it, it's just checking to decide whether or not to send it, block it or quarantine it or see what your instructions are. And so it really needs to be enabled on both sides. So you need to have it enabled and then comp other companies that you do it with, um, do business with also need to have it enabled. So then that way, you know, somebody else can't impersonate you to them. Um, let's see, DMARC getting started. I would recommend if you're gonna embark on this um, to get some professional services involved um, because they, um, if you go through your email protection service, they'll probably have a really nice GUI that makes a nice graphical representation of all the traffic going back and forth that makes it really easy to digest. Otherwise, if you don't pay for this service, you're just digging through it in XML, which is kind of like really messy text and hard to go through. Um, and then, like I suggested before, you'll start the monitoring it and determine who's sending emails on your behalf. Start to contact your third party senders. And even if you have just a few of them, depending on what they're used to doing, 
this might be the first time they've ever heard of this, or this could be the 50th time. And so it might take them a while to kind of figure out what they can do on their end. And then you can use both SPF and DECOM, or you can use one or the other. And so that's something you want to work through as well. Um, for the most protection, you would do both, but sometimes your vendor can only do one or the other. And so you kind of work through and have that conversation. And as you get that information from them, you will um, update your public DNS. So even if you're just email, you're going to spend some time working with your public DNS team to get those records changed as well. And then ultimately, at the end of the day, you want to get it sent to reject. So those um, impersonation emails aren't out there anymore. And then the nice thing about this is if you do have all those defensively registered websites, you can enable DMARC on those and just enable them all to um, block right away because you're not using them for legitimate business purposes. So I know that was kind of like a lot of technical stuff and it's kind of a lot to wrap your head around. I just wanted to mention it so you know it's an option so you have something you can do at the office to stop others from impersonating you. Anybody have any questions on DMARC? So I have had a lot of luck uh, with Proofpoint. Um, you know, I always get salespeople saying, oh, it's overly complicated and things like that. But I found the, the interface to um, be very common sense. They have something called Proofpoint University. So when you're first getting set up, they got a lot of training for you to go through. And I've also found they're, um, if you do open a ticket, they're very responsive. The other ones are like Alert Logic or Mindcast. Yep. Yeah, my Mimecast is pretty popular. And so the last thing I'll end with is um, if you are a victim of business email compromise, you can file a complaint with the IC3, which is ran by the FBI, which is where they take all their internet complaints. So I don't know if any more questions or comments or where we want to go from here, but this is all I had. All right, thank you so much.